Okay, hi. Oops. All right, so this week um, we are, we're, we're moving on, we're talking about um, science as a, as a, as a thing that we do, um, and, and a big part of that is in science we observe. Um, so two things to consider when we think about this. Um, the first one is what is or what are the subjects of science? And part two is, are there things that cannot be understood or studied scientifically? Of course, the way that we study these things is, is through observing, and we're going to get to that in a moment. But first of all, in the creation and production of science, um, all things are, like everything in the world, not created equally. Um, so here's a map showing all of the scientific collaborations on journal articles that were published in scientific journals from 2005 to 2009. Um, and you can see all of the lines are like connecting two authors that are working together. And you can see that, um, these collaborations are dominated by people in the global north collaborating with other people in the global north. So this is obviously, um you know, something that, that isn't unique just to science, but is, is sort of an inherent um, inequity in our world. Um, again, the Global North, even on maps that you see in classrooms, is represented uh, bigger than it actually is. So there is a bias towards collaborations and production of scientific knowledge in the Global North. Let me skip over these. Which complicates things when we start talking about what are observations? How do we observe? So that's going to be kind of the gist of, um, of class today, of this lecture in particular, is what is observing? How do we observe uh, in science? So before we get into that, um, let's just review what the human eye can see. So the human eye can see a very small amount of the total electromagnetic spectrum. So this is the electromagnetic spectrum, um, right? So, the, so all types of radiation uh, in our universe can be represented on this electromagnetic spectrum. So you've got everything from gamma rays, which are, are very high frequency, very small wavelengths. So they're like, right? Um, and then on the other end, you've got radio waves, um, FM, AM, and long radio waves, which are, are very low frequency, really long wavelengths. And what the human eye can see is a very small part of that electromagnetic spectrum, which we call the visible spectrum, visible light. Okay, so this is what the human eye can observe. So if we're talking about observing in science, the first thing that probably most of us think of is, can the human eye observe it, right? So let's say that the human eye, so an example of, of a way in which we observe in science is we observe the weather. I'm a climate scientist, I'm obviously going to talk a lot about the weather. Um, and so in, uh, in science, one of the things that we observe a lot is we observe the weather. And here is an image of a hurricane. Um, from space, taken from space, and it's being presented as a true color image, Means meaning this is what it would look like if the human eye was looking at this hurricane from above. Um, so uh, kind of representing what we would see in just that visible spectrum. Now, of course, this image wasn't taken by a human eye. It was taken by a satellite, which has been designed to observe radiation at different wavelengths, um, to tell a, a more complete story than perhaps the human eye can observe. So, um, for example, this satellite has um, a, a sensor, a channel, that can observe blue radiation, so radiation in the blue wavelengths. It also has one that can observe radiation in just the red wavelengths. So we can't separate these in our eyes. Um, but this satellite can separate these two things. And you can see that these pictures look the same mostly, but there is a very, very 
slight difference. And that slight difference tells us a lot of information that we couldn't get just by observing with our eyes. Why does the red look clear? The red looks clear because the blue is picking up on stuff in the atmosphere. Because the atmosphere appears blue to us, right? So that's all the stuff that's in the atmosphere. Okay, this satellite also has an infrared channel. And infrared is a radiation wavelength that our eyeballs cannot see at all. Uh, we, can't, we can't perceive that in our eyes. But the satellite, which is taking this picture, can see that because we, we made it, we designed it to do that. And so it's giving us information from an infrared channel, a different look at this hurricane than what the human eye could see in a visible spectrum of, of radiation. This infrared channel in particular, if we, if we decompose the different values in, and we put a color bar on it, um, this channel can tell us a lot about the approximate height of the clouds in this hurricane. So the reds are obviously showing higher clouds, and so we can see from this image that this is a very strong hurricane. This is information that we couldn't get by just looking at the, the, the image with our eyeballs, basically. We need the observing power of a satellite which can see different radiation to tell us how strong this hurricane is. Okay, And that's so important because we then use those observations from those satellites to forecast where this hurricane is going to go. So we have to observe first before we can model. So that brings us to oops, <clears throat> five questions about seeing and objectivity. Right, So we're talking about uh, op of, about observing uh, with our with our eyes or or with a sensor on a on a satellite, but how objective are those observations? How real? How much? How close to the truth are those observations? So here are some things to keep in mind. One, direct perception. What is direct perception, right? And what is its relationship to reality? So if I can actually see it, like I can see this cup. That's, I'm directly perceiving it. So how real is this? Okay. Number two, what are some subjective variations in perception from one person to another? And is this a limitation can be overcome? So I can see something. Someone else can see the same thing and have a subjective interpretation that's different uh, than mine. So what is the truth? What is the objective truth? Right. Three, can we know things that about... Can we know about things that humans cannot perceive through our own senses? Or is this a different form of knowledge? So we can, right? We know that we can use satellites, we can use other things to, to glean information from things that humans cannot directly perceive with our senses, right? So is this considered a different form of knowledge? Is it still objective? Is it still, um, is it still an objective observation? Or has there been some um, introduction of subjectivity or error? Okay, number four, um, measurements. What is a measurement? And what does it take to trust that an instrument, whether that instrument be your eyes or a satellite, gives you reliable information about that measurement? Right, so is a measurement real? Um, is it something that we can actually measure with our, with our capabilities? And then number five, representation. If measurements do not replicate human perception, right? So if these measurements are not exactly what my eyes would see, how close to what we actually can see directly are they, right? So how um, do we represent measurements that the human eye or the human sensory system cannot perceive directly? These are all questions that we need to consider when we're thinking about observing and objectivity. All right, I'm skipping over this demo because uh, we're not in class together and it will be difficult for me to do um, from here. So let's move to this slide. I love this slide. It's really good. It's really, um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's going to really get you thinking along these lines of objective observation. So I'm going to ask you, what color is this? And you're all going to tell me yellow. Everyone in the room probably agrees, right? I think we all agree that this is yellow. I know we're not all here together, but I'm going to assume that most of you think, that, that, that all of you actually think that this is yellow. Um, so what does it mean if we do or do not agree? 
right? What if we don't all agree that this is yellow? What does that mean? Does that mean that it's not actually yellow? Or does it mean that we just have different interpretations of what it means for something to be yellow? Okay, sorry, we're back, I froze. <laughs> um, so what does it mean um, if we do or do not agree that this is yellow? Does it mean that it's actually not yellow, or does it mean that there's some sort of like interpretation, subjective interpretation error? Would other animals agree that this color is yellow? Can we assume that the picture of this thing is telling us about the thing? And finally, is color a property of this thing? Is it a property of the light we use to see the thing? Is it a property of the thing itself? What does it mean for this lemon to be yellow? So how does color work? Let's take some color illusions. A and B on this figure are Right, so you can see square A and square B. Those are different colors, right? Oops. I guess I don't have the slide to show that actually that's wrong. They are actually the same color. B appears lighter than A because it's in the shadow of this cylinder, right? Which is making the blocks that we're, our brains are associating with blocks that have the same color as A, right? To be, um, to be darker, and so that makes B appear lighter relatively to the surrounding dark blocks, which we're then associating with A. So our brains are doing some, some leaps here, but actually if we were to remove all the blocks, A and B are the same color. Okay, how about here? We've got a brown square on top and an orange square on the side, right? No, <laughs> wrong. They're actually the same exact color. They're both kind of brownish orange. But when I take away this, this uh, uniform background, this appears darker than this because our eyes are playing, playing tricks on us, right? This one is in the shadow, and so the relative colors around it, which our brains are associating with the same relative colors up here, um, are appearing darker, which makes this appear lighter than this. Okay, Oops. so so how is that happening? How are our brains doing that? Okay, these two dogs are different colors, right? The hues from the bottom to the top. This one's going from kind of bluish to yellowish, and this one's going from like bluish to lighter bluish, right? Wrong. They're actually oops. I guess I don't have the, the, the solution to this one as well, but there actually are the same colors and the same gradient of colors from top to bottom. It just appeared, they just appear different because this one has a yellowish background and this one has a bluish background. Okay, a perfect example of this that happens in your everyday life is if you're sitting out on your back porch or, or, or your front porch um, and the sun is moving in the sky and then shadows are forming as those shadows are forming, things are going to look different in the shadow versus how they looked before. But to our brain, okay, they're going to look the same. And this is because our brains do something which is known as color constancy. We correct for these environmental changes. We think we know what something is orange. So then when it's in the shade, okay, it still is orange in our brains but it, we're actually seeing a different color, technically. We're seeing a different wavelength. The different wavelength is reaching our eyes, okay? Um, so it's not the same wavelength of color, okay? But our brains are telling us it's the same color because of color constancy. Here's a perfect example. Taken out of context, this appears kind of like bluish, this appears kind of tannish, and this is almost like, uh, like a like a like a reddish brown kind of right. These are actually all white pieces of paper, 
white pieces of paper. They're the same color as this white background under sort of a constant daytime lighting situation, like a, the sun or like a bright indoor light, right? But these were taken from Catherine's book, um, Catherine, who's a physicist, right? Um, and they appear different colors to us, though they're all the same book paper. Okay, they're all this white paper. This is color constancy. This is our eyes correcting, okay? When we're looking at it, it's gonna look white, but on this uh, slide, they don't look white because we don't have that context. Our eyes haven't, our brains, our knowledge hasn't contextualized that for us. A perfect example of this phenomenon is the dress from 2015. Was the dress white and gold or was it blue and black? Our brains don't have a concept of, um, of what these colors were before. We've never seen them. We're just seeing them from this, from this photo. It's very confusing, right? And so some people's brains saw white and white and gold, and some people's brains saw blue and black. Neither of them were wrong because uh, we didn't have any context for what the colors actually were. We didn't have that color constancy. We didn't know beforehand what the colors were. So this brings us back to the original question, which is, is color a property of things, or is it a property of light? And can we determine this property objectively? Is the observation of color objective? The answer, of course, is that it's not, and it is not a property of, of things, and it is also not really even a property of light. Um, but we do, we can measure, actually, how much, uh, like what the radiation, what the wavelength of the radiation of light is that is coming back off, off an object, right? So that lemon under white light, right? Like a white light bulb from above would appear, uh, would send back to our eyeballs radiation in the yellow wavelength, around 600 nanometers. That's an observation. That's what our eyes would see. So we typically say that 600 nanometer wavelength light is yellow. Again, though, if we take that lemon and we put it in the shade, okay? We're still going to see it as yellow, but it's going to be sending back a much different wavelength of light to our eyes than 600 because it won't be appearing, uh, it won't be sending 600 nanometer wavelength light uh, back to our eyes. Um, but we're still going to see it as yellow. That said, we can take measurements, which we can then approximate as colors. Um, so those measurements, you might be able to argue, are objective. So now, normally, if we were in class, there's a, um, an activity that we would do using spectroscopes. Um, we're not going to be able to do that activity, unfortunately, unless I figure out how to, how to get you all a spectroscope. <laughs> um, but there will be a variation of this activity, which um, you'll, be, you'll be responsible for doing tomorrow, which will approximate, um, approximate this activity of, of, of observing, observing uh, something objectively. So I've been talking a lot about wavelengths. What is wavelengths? And what is a nanometer? So wavelengths are, so if these are, if this is visible light, right, um, which is traveling through space, some radiation, it can be all radiation has wavelength, but visible light is the only way, uh, radiation with wavelengths that we can see. Um, so uh, wavelengths are just uh, the measurement of the distance between, you know, if light is moving along in a wave, from the top of the wave to the next. Um, so for example, violet light, typically we call it violet light, um, has a wavelength of about 400 nanometers. Yellow light, 600 nanometers, right? Red light, 665, etc. Ultraviolet radiation can have wavelengths of like um, a million nanometers, right? Or uh, like a couple thousand, 100,000 nanometers. Okay, so, um, yeah, so, so, so that's what we're saying when we're saying uh, wavelengths. So we can measure wavelengths. We can measure what the, what the intensity of the light in a particular wavelength is that's coming back and, and being received by our eyes or our satellite sensor or whatever ob thing we're using to, to observe. We can then call that, for example, blue light. Um, 
but that doesn't really mean so much um, because of this color constancy issue, right? We're, we see blue, kind of know what blue is, but then we take that and we put it in a different lighting environment and it's bouncing different radiation back at us. We might still say it's blue, um, even though it's sending 400 nanometer light back to our, to our eyes just because of the context of where it was. That's what leads to things like the dress, right? Where our eyes don't understand what wavelength and what the context of that wavelength is. I hope this is making sense. Um, yeah, so, so, so for example, for this group exercise, we would be using a spectroscope, which can take the light that's being reflected off things like a lemon um, and break it down into the wavelengths that are being um, actually reflected. So if we were looking at this lemon, what we would see through the spectroscope is just wavelengths in this region because it appears very yellow. So we wouldn't really see wavelengths on either end. We wouldn't really see this light up in the spectroscope or this, this light up in the spectroscope. So this is where the group exercise would go and I'll talk about this more tomorrow with you. It's also really important as we're thinking about this to think about what counts as white light. So white light is typically all the light that our eye can see at once, all the wavelengths that our light can see at once. So typically, um, you know, it would we would think that it would just be all of them at an even amount, okay? But when we perceive white light, like for example, the light that's shining at me appears white when I look at it, but is it actually white? Um, so for example, um, a, a, a light bulb, um, maybe, maybe, ref maybe sending white light, but actually really sending a lot more light in wavelengths between, you know, 550 and 650, um, even though it's sending all the wavelengths that's going to appear white, this light would probably appear a little bit more yellowish, um, because there's more of the yellow wavelengths coming through. So it'd be a yellowish white. A compact fluorescent, right, or a fluorescent light bulb, rather, um, is going to send little spurts at almost all the wavelengths, which when combined together are going to appear very white. Um, and an incandescent uh, sends less of the, of the, of the lower uh, wavelength um, uh, radiation, like blue, what we would typically associate with like a blue and violet light, and more of the uh, yellow, orange, and, and red, which is why uh, when you see a, an, an incandescent, right, uh, just like an, an old-fashioned light bulb, um, they appear kind of kind of yellowish orange almost. So white light is really hard to obtain in our in our world, actually. So th thinking about observing, right? If you're looking at something like this, like a picture of the galaxy, for example, do you really care what color label a human would apply? I think we can all look at this and say like, this appears orange and blue and white and yellow just by kind of uh, a quick glance. But are those real? I mean, someone, an artist really, made this image and put those colors onto it because that's not what the satellite, that's not what the sensor is seeing. The sensor's not seeing a color. It's seeing a wavelength and an intensity, right? This is what the sensor, for example, would be seeing. It would be seeing an intensity um, of different stars, right? These are different stars. Um, wavelengths uh, of the of the radiation that's being reflected back at you, and then we're just putting a color on top of it that we think works. It's really more of an artistic representation than anything. So returning to these initial five questions, I want you to sort of read through these again and think about them, thinking about direct perception and its relationship to reality, thinking about subjective variations in perception, from one person to another. Um, again, thinking about objectivity and observation. Can we know th about things that humans cannot perceive through our own senses? We can, yes, but is this a different form of knowledge? Maybe. Um, measurements, how do we take measurements? What does it mean to take and trust an instrument that gives you a reliable information information and measurement? Um, and if, if those measurements don't exactly replicate human perception or direct perception, how do we represent them, and is that representation correct, right? Or are we going to be ac accused of bias or manipulation or something like that, right? So these are important things to consider um, as we're thinking about 
observations and objectivity. So I'm going to leave it on this slide. Um, uh, again, I'll, I will introduce the group activity that we're going to do in class, but this is kind of an introduction to, to, to what does it mean to practice science and what does it mean to observe things, um, what is objectivity in science, and I think the reading and the first homework assignment um, are all going to be related to this, and so, so, so those will complement this short lecture and our discussion in class uh, tomorrow. So I will see you then.